It's always been thought the first humans to master the oceans were our species. But new evidence is starting to point to something far older. A million years ago, ancient humans may have already been crossing miles of open sea. And that leaves us with a shocking question. If they did conquer the ocean that early, then what else have we underestimated about them? Hi guys, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Michael. I have a degree in ancient history and on this channel, we discuss the unexplainable mysteries of our past. Let's get into it. For years, the story was simple. Early humans, like Homo erectus, walked out of Africa, fanned across mainland Asia and stopped where the land stopped. The maze of seas in Indonesia, broken by deep ocean channels, was treated as a natural moat, a barrier marked by the Wallace Line, a biogeographic boundary thought to be impassable. Even during ice ages, when sea levels dropped by more than a hundred meters, those straits stayed open, blue, and very deep. You couldn't just stroll across. Wallacea, the island zone between Asia and Australia was supposed to be off limits right up until our species, Homo sapiens, showed up with real watercraft around 50 to 60,000 years ago. Seafaring was never thought to have occurred before this date. But in recent years, some cracks in that tidy picture have started to emerge. On Flores, east of the Lombok Strait, archaeologists found a small-bodied island hominin known as Homo floresiensis and some stone tools dated to roughly a million years old. On Luzon, in the Philippines, butchered rhinoceros bones and tools at Kalinga landed at about 700,000 years old, possibly from Homo erectus. These finds implied that archaic hominins had, somehow, made it across serious water barriers long before Homo sapiens even emerged. But still, many researchers brushed them off, treating them as oddities, fascinating, mysterious, but exceptions rather than a rule. However, last month, a groundbreaking paper was published that blows this question wide open. In August 2025, Nature published a paper titled Hominins on Sulawesi during the early Pleistocene. Sulawesi is a rugged island in Indonesia, one that crucially sits east of the famous Wallace Line, and has been separated from mainland Asia by deep stretches of ocean for 45 million years. However, an Indonesian-Australian team of archaeologists on the island excavated a site called Kalio and recovered seven small stone artefacts, sharp-edged flakes and fragments with the textbook scars of deliberate napping. They were stone tools, and they dated to at least 1.04 million years old, possibly up to 1.48 million years old, vastly older than the next oldest tools found on the island. This means someone reached Sulawesi over a million years earlier than we thought. And they didn't just wander across land, they had to have crossed miles and miles of open water. It is the earliest evidence of humans crossing ocean barriers to reach isolated landmasses. But here's the part that should make your jaw drop. To reach Sulawesi from the Asian shelf, you must cross real ocean. The Makasa Strait between Borneo and Sulawesi is a deep waterway, and no land bridge existed, even at the lowest sea levels. So if hominins were on Sulawesi up to 1.5 million years ago, then how did they get there? How is this even remotely possible? Well, there are two plausible options. Option one is the traditional theory. They ended up there by accident, clinging to storm-torn vegetation rafts or swept out on tsunami debris. Imagine that, a terrifying journey being blown out to sea, certain you would die, swept across the ocean until, miraculously, you land on an island. It's possible, however, there are several problems with this view. First, the distances involved. Even at the times of lowest sea level during the Pleistocene, the Makassar Straits were never narrower than about 75 kilometers. The odds of a random drift carrying a group large enough to become a breeding population that far are quite low. Second, survival. Imagine a group of hominins washed out to sea, no food, no fresh water, scorched by a tropical sun. Most would surely perish long before reaching land. And finally, the archaeological record doesn't suggest a one-off fluke. The tools on Sulawesi span thousands of years, meaning that whoever arrived survived and populated the island for millennia. Which brings us to the other possibility, option two, 
they meant to do it. These hominins weren't just helpless passengers of nature, but deliberate seafarers. They looked out across the horizon, saw land in the distance, and somehow built watercraft sturdy enough to carry groups of them across the open ocean. Now, just think about how radical that would be. More than a million years ago, long before Homo sapiens even existed, our ancestors may have been planning voyages, coordinating groups, and mastering the sea. This isn't just survival, it's imagination, technology, planning, and exploration. Perhaps they did it by island hopping, but who knows? However, if true, it is a remarkable feat. Either way, accident or not, this discovery further proves that archaic humans were crossing dozens to hundreds of kilometers of open water, more than a million years before Homo sapiens took a single stroke. So how does that change things? Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, we already knew that early humans made it across large stretches of water. Flores, for example, is also cut off from the mainland by deep channels, as is Luzon. Now, these were always thought to be accidents, the unintentional swept out to sea and somehow surviving and colonizing theory that I mentioned earlier. But with the addition of Sulawesi, the picture shifts, because now this isn't just one or two strange outliers anymore. No, now we've got multiple islands across the region, all showing early human presence, all separated by deep sea. In my view, that tips the balance away from the idea of lucky accidents. After all, how many flukes can you stack up before it stops looking like chance? Instead, it's starting to look like a regional pattern early humans deliberately and repeatedly breaching ocean barriers. And that is astounding, because if these crossings weren't just accidents, then early humans a million years ago were doing something we never thought they could, planning. To build even the simplest raft, you need to gather materials, tie them together, and keep the thing buoyant enough to carry a group of people. You need coordination, communication, and some kind of leadership to organize the trip. And you need imagination, the ability to look at a distant horizon and think, there's land out there, let's try to reach it. In other words, these weren't just mindless wanderers stumbling around the tropics. They were problem solvers, explorers, and innovators. This pushes the roots of human curiosity and ingenuity far deeper back into the past than we'd ever imagined. Now, some will still be skeptical. They'll argue that we're reading too much into a pile of stone tools, that accidents can and do happen, and that maybe a few lucky castaways survived long enough to leave a trace. Fair enough. But when you step back and look at the pattern, Flores, Luzon, and now Sulawesi, it's getting harder to think these were all freak one-off events. At some point, coincidence starts looking like behavior, and the weight of evidence is beginning to lean towards the idea that early humans weren't just passengers of nature. They were agents of their own voyages. But let's take this one step further. If early humans were crossing to Sulawesi more than a million years ago, then we have to ask, how far could they have gone? Because once you've cracked the problem of sea travel, the rest of Wallacea opens up, and sitting just beyond it is Sahul, the joined landmass of Australia and New Guinea. Now, the textbook answer is that Homo sapiens were the first to set foot in Australia around 50 to 60,000 years ago. Sites like Majed Bebe in the Northern Territory are held up as the oldest solid evidence of human presence. But in recent years, some controversial findings have hinted that the story might not be so simple. Take Moijil on the coast of Victoria. At first glance, it looks like an ordinary rocky shoreline, but scattered there are strange signs. Concentrations of shell deposits, cracked and burnt stones, and patches of what some archaeologists argue are the remains of ancient hearths. But shockingly, these features have been dated to 120,000 years ago. In fact, archaeologists argue the evidence, quote, supports a cultural origin over a natural origin. It's just that the absence of associated stone artifacts means this conclusion cannot be proved definitively. However, if that interpretation is right, it would mean humans were in Australia more than twice as long as the standard timeline allows. Not just arriving with the Great Sapiens expansion out of Africa, but potentially much, much earlier, and perhaps by a different lineage entirely. Now, this is fiercely debated. Plenty of scholars argue that the burnt stones at Moijil could be the work of natural bushfires, not campfires. That the shells could be natural accumulations. In other words, don't rewrite the textbooks just yet. 
But if even part of the Moidil evidence does point to people being there 120,000 years ago, then suddenly the Sulawesi discovery takes on a new weight. Because we now know hominins were in the neighborhood, crossing straits, reaching islands, pushing boundaries, hundreds of thousands of years before Homo sapiens showed up. And that opens the door to a radical possibility. What if Australia's human story doesn't start with us at all? What if earlier hominins, Homo erectus, Denisovans, or even some unknown cousin made the leap into Sahul long before sapiens ever dreamed of it? It's a tantalizing possibility, but let's just speculate for a minute. Say it's true that humans mastered sea travel this early. What would that mean for how we think about human intelligence and history? If the Sulawesi tools really do represent deliberate sea crossings over a million years ago, then the timeline of human ingenuity just shifted dramatically. We tend to think of Homo sapiens as the only true explorers, the species that tamed fire, built boats and gazed at the stars. But this evidence suggests those sparks of creativity and daring were alive long before us. Imagination and planning weren't exclusive to our lineage. They were baked into the broader human story from much earlier. And that changes how we see our ancestors. For decades, the stereotype of early hominins was of half-aware wanderers, stumbling across the savannah, driven purely by survival. But if they were looking at an open horizon, designing and building rafts, and deliberately launching into the unknown, then we have to credit them with a kind of vision. They weren't just surviving, they were experimenting, innovating, and in their own way, dreaming. The implications of that would be huge. It means intelligence didn't suddenly explode with Homo sapiens. Instead, the roots of exploration and curiosity stretch much deeper, into Homo erectus and maybe even beyond. It suggests the human spark wasn't a lightning bolt, but a long, slow fire, smouldering for over a million years. And perhaps most provocatively, if our ancestors could sail across Wallacea that long ago, then the map of ancient human migration might be far wider than we've ever admitted. Maybe other islands held visitors whose traces we haven't yet found. Maybe Australia's story really does begin not 60,000 years ago with us, but with another branch of humanity entirely. In short, discoveries like Sulawesi remind us that human history isn't a straight line of progress, with Homo sapiens striding onto the stage as the first real thinkers. It's a tangled web of experiments, failures, and bold attempts by many different human species. And every time we push that timeline back, it forces us to rethink what it means to be human, and just how long we've been daring to cross the horizon. Thanks so much for watching guys, if you enjoyed this video please leave a comment or a like down below or consider subscribing to my channel. See you next time.